habitation of God. That's what it means. To be the church means we are the habitation of God. The Bible said, no, you know that we are all the body of Christ, that God dwells amongst us. And if God dwells amongst us, then anything that is contrary to God must take its exit. Hallelujah. I pray that this morning as you listen to the word, you know the power is in the word, that as you listen to the word, that God will begin to do a work in you. You know, a preacher said something, and I believe with him 100%. He said, look, it's not about you being challenged from the word. It's about you being transformed by the word. And my desire, each time I come here and stand before you, and I don't take it lightly, I don't take it lightly. My prayer is always God challenge and transform lives. I'm not interested in, oh, you know, you, uh, you preach so well. Or, all those compliments, please keep them to yourself. <laughs> keep them to yourself. If you get challenged, be transformed. Let the word change you inside out. Inside out, we've got people that teach us how to dress, how to work, how to... No, you don't do it outside in. It start, the change starts from inside and it flows to the outside. If you don't have a changed heart, you will not be a change you. This month is the month of Christmas, it's the December month, it's the month where people take it easy, it's the month where we kind of like, you know, lay back and kind of relax, it's the month where people are in a festive mood, where there are lights and, uh, you know, you walk around the town and you just feel like you are, you know, not in the same city that you've been all this month, all of a sudden, you begin to see things you've been walking past because you're so busy, you can't see them, and now that you're in a more relaxed atmosphere, in a relaxed mood, you can see and appreciate these. Have you, have you noticed the birds that, you know, they just, they don't fly high. They, they're always there. You walk around. Now you can see those birds, right? Praise the Lord. And so our theme for this month is God with us. God with us. And it is an appropriate theme because Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And today, I want to preach on who is with you? Who is with you? And this question was, this question is what I would like to, to answer for all of us. Who is with you? You know, the more you understand God, and I'm using the word understanding because I'm also a teacher, there is a difference between knowing and understanding. Knowing is still some head knowledge. Understanding, is, it begins to affect you because now you can explain to somebody that which you know. Now when you move from being able to explain to somebody that which you know, then that knowledge is deeply rooted in you. Anytime to you, you can explain it. So the more we understand God, the more our lives changes. The more we get more realigned with God's plan. The more our faith gets strengthened, the more our love grows. So understanding who God is is important. And today I'll be looking at understanding God's love for us. Because if we know who is with us, we will walk differently. If we know who is with us, we will act differently. We will respond to situations differently. You know, if you walk around, 
John. If you walk around and a three-year-old said he's going to beat you up, what will you do? You just laugh, right? Because you know it's not possible. So each time I hear the voice of the devil, that's what I do. I just laugh. It comes from us understanding our God. So the question again is, who is with you? Who is with you? Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I'll start reading from verse 31. I'll read up to verse 39, and I'm using the New King James Version. What then shall we say to these things? Now, the things Paul is referring to here, to give you a background, is from the beginning he started to talk about uh, that there is no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, right? Because we have the law of Christ, the law of life in us, and so the law of sin and death cannot be in us. And then he went on to talk about our sonship through the Spirit. For those that are called by the name of the Lord are the sons of God. And if you look at backward verse 14 that says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So that is telling us that we are adopted children. We are God's children. And then he said in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is who? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also reason who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, give us the interpretation. Bless our hearts as we go through this word and minister to us. Let no one leave this place without the word. In Jesus' name, amen. If God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who has the ability to be against us? Who is that person that dares to stand against us or to go against us if God has got my back? When we were little kids, you remember, you know, when we look for trouble, we make sure that elder brother is around. I still show my younger brother the mark of the wound I got for defending him when we were in primary school. Left a small mark 
And I still have that to let him know that I was big brother and I was always there for him. If God is God, you're back. Who is that person that there is to be against you? Now, how do we know God is for us? Because remember, the question is who is with you? Okay? How do we know God is with us? Well, number one, God said it. He said, I'm with you. But the Bible says that he gave his son for us. In verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His begotten son. No, no wonder we, uh, Abraham is referred to as the friend of God because Abraham was tested with his only son and he was willing to deliver him to God. That's the title of Abraham. He's the friend of God. If God will give his one and only son for us, what else? What else is there that he will not be able to give to us? That's, that's, that's what the, the writer of Romans is talking about. Said, if God, who did not even spare his own son for our sake, for our sake, but delivered him up, how would he not with Christ give us all things? Why would he not with Christ give us all things? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, some people, want to, some people always want to clean themselves up before they come to Christ. told you your sin is too big to be forgiven? There is no sin. There is no sin that is above the grace of God. You know, there is the unforgiven sin, and I'm not going to dwell on that, but I can assure you <laughs> that for you to get to the point where you commit that kind of sin, it will really be a serious, serious big situation. But there is no sin that is above the grace of God. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven by God. The grace of God is much, much bigger than what you think your sin is. So, but you don't know me, you know, I've done this, I committed abortion, I killed little babies, or I, I stole, I... I mess around, God says, while you were, Christ died for who? While you were a sinner. Please get that understanding. Some of us grew up in a Christian family. And so we think, you know, I was born into Christ. I've gone on evangelism. And somebody tells me, no, I was born in the name of Jesus. So, okay. Does that make you born again? You know, that doesn't make you being born again. You have to accept Christ on your own. And while you were still in sin, Christ died for you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 to 6, let's turn to that. We're just trying to establish the fact that God, that if God is for us, who can be against us. Hebrews chapter 13, from verse 5 to 6, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Now, at times when we are out of vindication, 
In Vinduk, you are known to be born again. Oshiveva. You know? And then you leave Vinduk because it's holiday time. And you travel to the north, far north, or far south, or far east, or far west. Nobody knows you there. Us and Oshiveva. Right? <laughs> now you have to prove to yourself, not to God, because God knows all things. You have to prove to yourself whether you know who is with you. Or you travel. How many of you travel a lot, you know? You go for business trips. And you stay in all kinds of hotels, you know, you, you go to all kinds of places. And you are there in this strange land. In a hotel, all by yourself. Ah, now you have to prove for yourself whether you are a child of God. It is not when the born agains are around you and are watching you that you have to prove anything to anybody. It is when you are out there, isolated. That's when the devil comes around and says, Did God say? Did he say? You know, we have to also prove to ourselves that we are indeed children of God. We have to do it for ourselves. When God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, go and sacrifice him. The Bible said God knows the end of a thing from what? From the beginning. So we can conclude that God actually knew that Abraham would get to that extent. The lamb was already arranged. Everything was arranged. But God wanted Abraham to also know that this is how far I've come with God. And you know, when you pass a test, you say to yourself, if I've come this far with God, if I can do this for God, I know I'm going to stand with Him. And today is not going to be your sweet, sweet, rosy, rosy sermon. Because there are some tough things that we are going to come through. But it's important. Because even on the bed of roses, there are some thorns. Bed of roses with thorns. In Matthew chapter 28 from verse 90 to 20, when God was giving us the commandment to go and preach the gospel, baptizing the people in the name of the Son and the Spirit and the Father, and he said, teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you, and he said, Lo, I am with you always. At times we behave as if God is not with us. At times, we are not conscious of the presence of God. There are certain things that if you're conscious of the presence of God, you wouldn't do. Sure? Which means we need to really, really practice the consciousness of God. Or God's consciousness. We have to practice. We have to remind ourselves that God says, You will never leave me nor forsake me. I'm not saying that you should be walking around timid. You know, at times when people come into church, well, some churches, right from the door, you have to touch some holy water, do something, I won't say what, <laughs> and then you go in, and the moment you step into the, the building, there is a psychological feeling that, wow, God is here. You know that feeling? I've visited one of the places I love to visit when I travel abroad is cathedrals. And you know, those cathedrals, they make you feel, you really feel that mm, there, is, there, is a, there is a bigger being in here. I am I'm really small. You, 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 you feel it, right? It's all religion. It's psychology. The architects designed it like that. They purposely design it to make you feel insignificant when you move into a cathedral. 
It's a fact. All those Gothic architecture, it was designed for that purpose. So that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the consciousness of God. I'm talking about the consciousness of the fact that if you have a father that loves you and cares for you, whose presence you enjoy, with, amongst whom you can just be free, you can be yourself, there are certain things that if I tell you this is how my children are, you will not believe me because they are freer with me. They are not that free with you. Because in a sense, you're some kind of stranger, even though we are brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know, there are certain things you don't do before brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know. But at home, they are free. Do you get the point? That's the kind of consciousness I'm talking about. One of love. One of care. One that you know, even when you mess up, he may look at you like this, telling you, you know what you've done, but not saying I will deny you. No. A father that corrects puts you on the right course. A father who loves you to know that he's always there for you. Have you seen how little kids behave when they know daddy is around? They run around. They run and then they look back and when they see the parents are coming, what do they do? around especially when you're in the airport or in the aircraft you see these funny things these kids they are so you know daddy is here that's the kind of consciousness we need to practice because he said i will never leave you nor forsake you i will never leave you nor forsake you now there is a, a, a scripture in isaiah that i really love and i'm sure some of you probably have have seen it isaiah i'd like to give it to you isaiah chapter 49 Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 and 16. It says, Can a woman forget a nursing child? Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? It's a question. And God is answering the, the question. He said, Surely. The may forget, at times you forget till you hear the cry. Then you, oh, my child, my child. At times it happens, right? So, so surely the may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. What an intimate, intimate relationship. You need to underline this scripture in your Bible. Highlight it. Make a note. I'm a favorite of God. Even if, you know, a nursing child, even if the mother forgets a nursing child, he said, I will not forget you. I've written your name. You know, when I read that, I was looking at my palm. No wonder people do palm reading. Oh, the radio. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. my name is. When God was at His palm, sees me. Praise the Lord. So, if God is for us, if God is God, my back, who can be? Who is that person that wants to be against me? When people are against you, it's because they don't know who is behind you. Very soon they will find out. If a situation is against you, that's because that situation is yet to know who is for you. Very soon, they will find out. And I don't even have to give it a second thought. You know, when people talk about you and the gossip or they say stuff, and when you are in leadership position, people will always talk about you. I've been in leadership position for so long to know this. Whether in church or at work or in a club. Or if you are a child of God, do God's business and let those who have allowed themselves to be used by the devil to continue to do the devil's business. But you know that the devil himself, the big Satan himself, cannot touch you. He has to go past through Jesus. 
He has to go past through God to get to you. So why worry? Why get what urban disturbed about? Oh, she said, he said, they said. Let they, let him, let her, let them say whatever they want to say. I am in Christ. I will do my work and I will stand on the solid rock. That's how believers should behave. So if you have an understanding of who God is, the one that is with you, the way you react to situations will be completely different. There are colleagues of mine that already know how I will respond or react to situations. How did I know this? Because they've told me. <laughs> it doesn't mean that if you're wrong, that you won't be told you're wrong. It doesn't mean because I'm your boss, you can do just whatever you want to do. Okay? But there is something about believers that know their God. That even unsaved people feel safe in their hands. There is something very special about believers who know their God who understand their God. Verse 33, let's go back to the main scripture again in, in Romans. I hope you get in challenge to be transformed. So again in verse 33, the next question is, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now, I'm talking to those that are born again. If you are saved, the question is, who will bring a charge against you? Right? It is God who justifies. So, God who justifies, is he, is he the one that will bring a charge against you? Because his business is to do what? To justify you. That's his business, to justify you. You know, because some of you, when you sin, it's like the whole, it's like there, are, there is a, a doctrine, there is a church that has a doctrine that if you sin, you lose your salvation. Then you pray and pray and pray and pray until you, you get your salvation back. And then you keep hoping that nothing happens. Because once you sin again, oh, I've lost my salvation, and then you pray and pray and pray and pray. It's a doctrine. There is a church like that. Okay. And they, 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 they pray like Pentecostals, so make no mistake. Because I've, in my zeal, I've attended a conference I was not supposed to attend. I even took, I even took my, uh, my, my, my cousin with. My cousin was not even saved, and I took him with me. I said, let's go. Oh, I just saw something Christian. Oh, let's go in town. And we had to stay overnight. Ooh, it was just one night. There was supposed to be another night and another night. And by the following day, I said to you, we are going back home. They didn't understand what was happening there. Who is he who condemns? That's the next question. Who condemns? Who is, you know what it, when it said condemn, it's like a verdict. All right? Like a verdict. Who is going to give that verdict? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also what? Risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also made accuser. You are doing the devil's work. Leave that to the children of the devil. It's not for you. You remember the story of Job? Job was a very prosperous man. God bless him with so many riches and cattle and children. And, and then the Bible said that when the sons of God went to give a report to God, who was there? Satan was also there. And Satan, what? Did Satan say anything good about Job? No, he was out to accuse. He was the accuser. That's what the devil does. He knows he can get to us 
So he, every little thing, he says, ah, and you call him your daughter, you call, her, you call him your son, you call her your daughter. Look at what she's done. He's the one that is constantly accusing. But thank God that Jesus is there. And Jesus is on the right-hand side. You know what the right-hand side signifies? It signifies the place of authority. It signifies the right-hand person, the right-hand person of God. A place of authority. And Jesus Christ intercedes for us. He prays for us and intercedes for us. The Bible says, but the believers overcame, in verse 11, overcame him by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Some of you don't testify. You have to testify. If you believe what you've got inside of you, you've got to testify about it. You have to testify. Because you can overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which have saved you, but by what? By the word of your testimony. You have to confirm what you believe by testifying about it. Don't, when they say, is it true that you are now born again? And you start like, mm, scratching your head. No. Yes, I am born again. I'm a child of God. It's not being big head or being proud to say you're a child of God. You're a child of God. That's what the Bible calls you. I told you once a Muslim friend of mine asked me that, but you, you believers, why do you always refer to Jesus as the Son of God? That is something the Muslims will not say. They will not take that. To them it's heresy. If you, start an, if you start a discussion with the Muslim and you start by saying, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ who is the Son of God, you finish the discussion. Clear. Finish. Full stop. And I said to him, look at it. In Matthew, I open to Matthew chapter 3, you know that scripture where the Bible says, and the heavens open, and God declared, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I turned to him and said, well, if God says, who am I? Of course, you know, they don't believe that, the, that this Bible that we have, that is the real Bible. They believe that there is a real Bible, but that this is not the real Bible. But don't engage in debate, okay? Just love on them. Just love on them. I'm, I'm blessed to have Muslim friends, because then I, I, can, I can also show forth the fruit of the Spirit. So Jesus Christ is our defender, the devil is the accuser, but we as believers, we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We need to testify on a regular basis. We need to testify about God. We need to speak about Him. So when you go for holidays, for those of you that will be traveling, remember, if you meet that friend of yours that you've not seen for many, many years, and you start asking, so how life been with you? So what are you doing now? If you don't want to ask directly, are you born again? Say, so which church do you go to? Start from that corner, you know. <laughs> so which church do you go to? If the person starts saying, mm, you know, I, mm, yeah, then you know that there is a story there. And your goal should immediately be, okay, I need to testify. I need to testify. Always tell about the goodness of God. What God has done for you. You don't have to have a big testimony. You know, like people say, you know, I was trusting God for a million Namibian dollars. And I just got in my SMS. Somebody have deposited. Mm -hmm. Please find out whose money have strayed into your account. That's not how God operates. Okay? Doesn't mean that God cannot bless you. Doesn't mean that God cannot bless you. Okay? But I've had these stories in some places where people are getting money in their accounts mysteriously. It can also disappear mysteriously. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question. The next question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now we know how much God loves us. But the question, who 
shall separate us from the love of Christ. Will trouble? Now, Paul is... <laughs> when Paul was writing this letter to the Romans, there was a perceived persecution that was, that was going to cut across Rome. As, when he was writing, the persecution was not yet there. So he was actually preparing them for what was going to happen. I hope you know that when you read the New Testament, all those believers who read about Peter and Paul, who you can hear of the miraculous things that happen in their lives, I hope you know they also suffered. I hope you know that some of them were sick at the point, and they have to trust God. And so suffering and hardship, it's something that comes as a test to see whether it will affect you, your relationship with God. And so he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble do it? Or hardship? Or persecution? Or even famine? Famine is luck, right? Not just ordinary luck. Seriously, like seriously, it's not there. Will that separate you from the love of God? Will nakedness? Huh. Somebody said when a lady said, I don't have anything to use for the day, it means something else. It's not that there is nothing at all. It's that there is nothing that suits this occasion. That's not what we're talking about here. It's like really, really, really there is nothing. You know, I've got only one set. So with nakedness, will that separate us from the love of God? Will danger, will sword? And some of you have not gone through any persecution. There was a time, I think it was 1985, 86, thereabout, we had a very big religious uprising in my, in my town. And uh, the Muslims have met and there was supposed to be a very big riot, you know, Muslims were to go after Christians. And I met a former high school friend of mine. And he told me, he said, uh, he, they normally call me John Akai. He said, John Akai, you probably will want to leave because there will be... So he was so kind to... You know what happened? All the churches in that city were burnt down. All of them. We all have to run for our dear life. But after that, bigger and better churches were rebuilt on those spots where the old ones were burned. Our prayer life, in fact, the church became united. White garment churches and suit tying churches we are meeting together to pray. Catholics, Anglican, Pentecostals, Baptists, we were all meeting to pray. It became a habit that at the beginning of the year, we will take turns going from one church to the other and praying. And not just prayer where somebody stands up and just pray one short prayer and sits down. And, no. Even the Anglicans were with us on that. The Baptists were with us. We all prayed like praying from our hearts. So will persecution, will sword, he said, neither death nor life, angels, demons, present situation, future situation. Present situation, future situation, height, great achievements or depth, depression. Will any of this separate you from the love of God? When you have plenty or when you have little, will that be the factors that determine your commitment to God. It's your situation, your current situation, the determining factor for whether you will serve God or not. Some of you, the only time we hear you say, praise God, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise, is because you've got to receive a blessing. <laughs> we want to hear you praising God even when you're going through a tough time. And say, praise God, this is a situation for you to show up. This is a time for you to manifest yourself. Praise the Lord in good times. Praise the Lord in bad times. God's love for us is not affected by our situation. 
Our love for him should not be altered by our condition. God's love for us is not affected by our situation. It doesn't matter what we're going through. God is still with us. Even when you feel like he's not there, faith is not feeling. He is there. Even when you feel, you know, some people say, I'm at my lowest. Even when you're at your lowest, God is there. That's what his word has said. And I take the word and I believe the word. And whatever the word says about me, that's what I am. Not what the world says or not what somebody else says. It's what the word says. If your faith is not worth dying for, then it's not worth living for. If what we believe, the God we believe, if we cannot die for what we believe, then it is not worth living for. Forget it. Forget it. So let's take a few lessons from this. The first one is, if you know the God you serve, you will act differently. True? Now, I would like you to do this exercise because my time is fast spent. Go and study the names of God. I'm going to review a few. Go and study the names of God. And each name of God reveals his relationship with us. Now, you remember when Abraham was asked to give his own son as a sacrifice. And he went and just when he was about to slaughter the the son, what happened? God called and said, don't. And God provided the lamb. And on that mount, Mount Horeb, God revealed himself to Abraham as who? As Jehovah Jireh. It says, I am the Lord that will what? Provide. It says, on the mountain, the Lord shall provide. It literally means the Lord will see to it. That's what it literally means. Jehovah Jireh literally means the Lord will see to it. That's our God. He will see to it. What is it you are going through? What issues do you have? God will do what? Then we have the example of Moses. And Moses was asked to go back and get the children of Israel out of captivity. And there was a dialogue between Moses and God. And Moses said, okay, God, now if I go to you, to these people, you know, the Israelites were kind of hardened and tough. You know, I haven't been under slavery for that long. You can imagine that their faces were always like kind of tight. And, you know, you, you must say something good to, to loosen their faces, you know. I mean, you've been... Slavery for how many years? You know, for quite a long time. So Mo Moses said to God, who will I say is this God? Because in Egypt there were several gods. And they all have names. So now I go to them and say, the God of your fathers. They'll say, what is his name? <laughs> and God said to Moses, tell them, Eye Ashe Aye. I am that I am. That word from Hebrew is literally translated in almost every English Bible as I am that I am. It means I will be or become whatever I want to be or become. It shows an immediacy. I am there exactly when you need me and I will be to you what you need immediately. That's the, that name, you know, I tried to study this name and I don't know the theologians in the house. I downloaded a four-page article just to explain I am that I am. It's one topic among theologians that they have been studying from, for, for us, we know that God is just saying, I am that I am. 
I will be to you whatever is needed to be. God will be or become who I want to become. Say, that is my name. Tell them that I am have sent you. You know, if you send somebody to take a message somewhere, for sure you must be able to describe or to say who is the sender, right? And if you are being sent to do something that is as audacious as what Moses was going to do, then definitely some level of the authority that you possess need to be communicated to the people, right? And so, and the theologian said this, that this name, I am, or Ehe, is the name for, by which God calls himself. I don't know whether it makes sense to you, but I mean, that to me is, is deep. It's like, what do I call myself? If you do, if you reflect, you reflect on yourself. What will you call yourself? I am is what God calls himself. This shows us that I am is with us and he can be whatever he wants to be for us. Amen. I will soon round up. The last thing I would like to discuss, or the last lesson, is if God's love is in you, you will not love the world. If God's love is in you, you will not love the world. First John chapter 1 from verse 15 says, Do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all these are from the world. The world has got a system. The world has got a system. And, and this is very important. And the devil wants us to be within that system and to operate within that system. The Bible calls this cosmos. Cosmos is the world system. Now this world system have the way they do things. As believers, we must not be within this system. We have our own kingdom. We are in the kingdom of God, not in the kingdom of this world. And so if God's love is within us, just because everybody is doing it, doesn't mean that I will just follow suit and do it. And that's why we don't get pushed around by what is happening around us. We don't get forced to do things just because it is in fashion. Now, if people are talking so much about who they are and what they have achieved, the Bible says that that is the world system. The pride of life. Do you know who you're talking to? By the way, do you know who you're talking to? You know, let's clear this. Those attitudes that the world uses shouldn't be in us. If the love of God is where? It's in us. Our primary goal and target is to win souls. That mindset must be in us. To win souls. And I want to challenge every one of us. Especially those of you that might be traveling. We will still be here having church. Of course, some of us will also travel and back. But as you travel, remember this. God is with you. 
And if God is not yet with you, and all this talk that I've been talking is like, what is he talking about? We are willing to give you an opportunity to make God be with you. Can we all rise up? Let's stand up. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because your word has gone forth and as you've said in your word that it will not return unto you void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it out. And so, Father, Lord God, as we give this opportunity, we just pray that if there be anyone here that is not saved, that you'll touch their heart and you'll minister to them and cause them to make it right with you today. I would like to give you an opportunity. If you're here today, and you have not received Jesus Christ into your life, you've not made a personal commitment to Him, this is an opportunity for you to make a commitment to Him. If you also want to recommit yourself because your life has not been what it ought to be. You once gave your life to Christ, you once prayed, but you're always going backwards into the world. On one leg in church, one leg back in the world. And you want to recommit yourself. I would also like to give you an opportunity. So I have two altar calls. The first one is if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you want Him to become Lord of your life, and the second one, if you want to rededicate yourself, you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. If you want to take a step on any of these two calls, I would like you to raise up your hand after the count of three. One, last indifference. Two, with Jesus. Three, remarkable life. Anybody in the house, you want Jesus Christ to come into your life or you want to rededicate your life, Anybody in the house? Anybody in the house will give you some time. Just think about it. If the Lord is telling you this is the time for you to come out and to be prayed for, we would like to connect with you. We would like to pray with you. If there be anyone, just raise up your hand. Anybody in the house? Okay, please do me a favor. Just open your eyes. Speak to the person standing next to you. and.